Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Chiefs and I will provide an update on the weekend's events and the city's preparations going forward. I really appreciate your patience, particularly as we continue to respond to the dual crises of COVID-19 pandemic and the state in Seattle, downtown, and across the nation. Um, we apologize to the press that we're still not at a point where we can meet in person, although many of you may prefer that. Um, I also am happy to announce on June 1st, the year is almost half over. Um, I want to start again with an acknowledgement and a reminder. Uh, so it is not lost in all of the press coverage over the last three days that at the core, the most important part of these events was what happened to George Floyd and how his murder resonated through decades of unjust treatment for black and brown people in America and particularly for African Americans. I will say I was able to watch just briefly today as his brother visited the site of his murder and it was heart-wrenching to see him have to do that and jarring again that it has been confirmed that Mr. Floyd died of asphyxiation and that his last words were, I cannot breathe, I can't breathe. So the anger, the grief, and the call to justice are real and they are justified. We must continue to examine and now must more deeply examine the impacts of racism. We have to do it honestly, and we have to recognize its impacts on all systems, education, health care, life expectancy, economic opportunity, every part of our lives. The truths about these inequities are stark, and the results have been deep, deep systematic inequities that have pervaded our society throughout the history of our country. I want to emphasize that the message of protesters here and across the nation that we need to be honest about that and need to do better to dismantle structural racism and end police violence was not and could not be drowned out by the acts of looting, destruction, and violence. As I said before, I believe the messages of love, peace, and justice are more enduring than division and destruction. I also want to recognize our police officers and our firefighters have worked long hours under very difficult circumstances trying to protect our city and its residents. Seattle Police Department has made tremendous progress since I investigated them as U.S. Attorney and helped negotiate the consent decree they have been in under for almost 10 years. These gains are due to their hard work but also the hard, hard work of community and our chief of police. But it doesn't mean we're done. Chief Best and I have made consistently clear that the only way the Seattle Police Department can lead the way on 21st century policing is if there's a culture, a culture of continuous improvement and examination. And I'm proud of the reforms and her insistence on such a culture. For decades, I have been fighting to reform the criminal justice system and have worked around police reforms. One way that we ensure reform is to make sure that we actually hold people accountable in a transparent way. I want to emphasize, especially for those who may be feeling without hope and who are feeling a lot of anger and despair, that SPD's improvements over the last decade would not have been possible without the public who is always pushing us to be better and demanding that we are accountable. I was on the oversight investigation that led to the creation of the Office of Professional Accountability. But that office has been improved largely due to community action and input. And it is that office that is actively investigating uses of force by the Seattle Police Department um, and those reports have come from a broad range of people throughout the community. I also know that without community and its work, we wouldn't have an Office of Inspector General who was here on Saturday to see in real time what was happening. 
Please know that the voice of community is and always will remain an important component of holding every part of government accountable, including our police department. I want to recap this weekend's protests and timeline. On Sunday, we saw significantly more peaceful demonstrations and noted a decrease in violence, property destruction, and theft, particularly when compared to Saturday. However, in Seattle and in other cities, we did see property destruction. We saw property destruction and looting in Bellevue and Tukwila in Renton, and we also saw some acts of violence. Again, I really want to emphasize the people who are protesting what happened to Mr. Floyd did so peacefully and with no intent to cause destruction, violence, and chaos. They came together to express their mutual grief and trauma to demand better action by their government and their police departments. And I am grateful to them and to all who continue to do what they need to do to keep this at the forefront of our minds in this city and across America. I want to remind all of those who seek to continue to gather in Seattle that if you are here to protest, we will protect you. It is your right. But if you are here to engage in chaos and destruction, your actions will not be tolerated. Chief Best and I acknowledge that as we react to the situation in real time, we, we have needed and will continue to need to make decisions um, as it relates to circumstances like Saturday's curfew. Please know that these decisions are made to protect health and safety and are caused by rapidly changing nature of events. For example, Seattle Police Department recently posted a timeline of Saturday's events in an effort to be transparent with the media and the public about how quickly things devolved. Chief Best and I were watching in real time. I was here at the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. She was at the Seattle Police Department's Operations Center. It was really marked how quickly and dramatically events unfolded across the city at multiple locations. I really hope that everyone can visit the blotter to see the timeline of events on Saturday, but I want to recap some of them so you can capture what we were seeing and how the decisions were made. At approximately 2.45 p.m. on Saturday, a peaceful demonstration at Westlake Park continued as groups in the vicinity of Westlake, Fifth and Pine began to escalate. As I said before, the protesters who came to Westlake Park in the thousands did so peacefully. It does not mean that their message was, express, was not expressing dissatisfaction with the city, with police, and with injustice. But they acted peacefully. At approximately 3.55 p.m., literally in a matter of minutes, there were multiple fires and Molotov cocktails being thrown. At the same time, demonstrators were marching on the highway into oncoming traffic. And a few minutes later, there were reports of assaults on officers, accelerants being poured at the SPD headquarters, and crowds gathering. All of these required not just a response from police, but a response from our firefighters so that we could try to control the, the, the circumstances that if fires were set, they would not spread or endanger human lives. Again, I hope residents and businesses visit this plotter to visit and see in real time what was happening. It was almost a tale of two or three cities. You had the thousands of people gathering at Westlake peacefully to gather and march, which they did. But within blocks, there were other people coming with backpacks that had rocks and pipes and projectiles and frozen water bottles. They started property damage, fires were set, they looted and stole business. And this was all in a very brief period of time which required the police department to both keep peace for those who were protesting lawfully and protesting peacefully, but also try to protect people and property in downtown Seattle. By midday Sunday, there were hundreds of buildings damaged, including more than 90 businesses in Chinatown International District. I want to say that again, over 90 businesses in Chinatown International District that were uh, damaged in the rioting. 
I'll let Chief Best speak to the finer details of the timeline and Chief Scoggins can address any questions related to the fires. But I can assure you that it was the rapid escalation of the demonstrations that was not something I had seen or Chief Best had seen since WTO. It was inconsistent with the hundreds of events we have in Seattle around a range of issues. And last night, we saw that we're not alone, as we saw over the weekend. Last night, we saw cities in D.C. and Boston, how events continued. And I will let Chief Best provide you with an update on that. Because some violence, property destruction, and theft continues in parts of the city, and there are threats of such actions, there will be another citywide curfew from 6 p.m. tonight till 5 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, 6 p.m. is one hour later. We've heard from some people you saw yesterday that there were protesters who protested peacefully, who did so even after the curfew, but it was uh, the police exercised their discretion to determine that they, were, they could do so and they could express their views, they could march and they could do so peacefully. Chief will continue to exercise her discretion as the chief of police. We expect a series of demonstrations across the city today um, and not just in downtown Seattle. As I said earlier, Seattle Police Department made no arrests for the violation of curfew over the weekend. Our intent was to educate and to encourage people to voluntarily comply. We have found that many people complied with a curfew, which means that then the Seattle Police Department and the Seattle Fire Department had better access to the roads and streets so first responders could respond as necessary, including to medical events. We know that over 40, 40 cities across this nation have implemented curfews over the weekend. It's not something any city does lightly. We are proud of our heritage for the ability to publicly gather and to be out and, and form society and community. But we also need to take into account the very real public health and safety implications as we see them. This morning, Chief Bess and I discussed the plans to continue to allow peaceful demonstrations and to protect our city from violence, looting, and chaos. We, both of those are mutual obligations. We have a duty to protect people who are exercising their First Amendment rights and if they're doing it peacefully. We also have a duty to protect those people and other people and property from the acts of violence and looting. When the chief of police says to me as mayor, I need a curfew to protect the residents and keep our community safe, I believe and trust she is the person in the best position to make that decision. There's a reason that our city charter puts the chief of police in charge of public safety in our city. I will also remind everyone that the Seattle and King County are still in phase one of the governor's safe start plan, which means that people should continue to physically distance ourselves and avoid gatherings. So please, if you are protesting, try to keep some social distance, wear your face coverings. I also want to remind people that there is a way for you to lodge complaints if you believe that you've witnessed a Seattle police officer acting with undue force or against regulations. I'll reiterate, the chief and I are proud of our department, but part of that pride comes from knowing we have a system to hold people accountable. Some of you know that I, again, led the investigation that led to the consent decree, and before that was on an oversight body that created the OPA. Trust between law enforcement and community is essential. It can be lost by the actions of just one officer. And if we didn't know that, we have seen that so starkly in the last four days as cities across this nation are racked in what we are seeing because of the actions of four officers in Minneapolis. I want to tell you, if you expect Please, if you experience or witness something that you believe is inappropriate, contact the Office of Police Accountability. We have heard a tremendous amount of support for our officers and the hours that they and the firefighters have put in. But we've also received many questions, both from the public and members of the media, about incidents of force that they believe might have been undue force. 
the chief and I and every supervisor at the Seattle Police Department take these seriously. Our accountability system allows the Office of Police Accountability to conduct an independent investigation of those incidents. And I can confirm that OPA is investigating incidents from over the weekend. I also want to take this moment to express my gratitude for Director Meyerberg at OPA and Inspector General Judge. You don't see it, but they've been working around the clock too. These types of events put more work on their shoulders because of their obligation to the public to be independent overseers of our department. We all want our city to be safe for people to express their First Amendment rights and safe for everyone else. Those things can and should and must exist together. Now I'll turn it over to Chief Best, who can ask any questions, and then Chief Scoggins will address questions. Um, we'll then uh, take questions after that. I, I just have to say one last thing again. I could not be more grateful for the work of the two chiefs standing with me today. Their work over the last five days truly has been nonstop, and their wisdom and advice they've been able to give me and what I've seen them be able to accomplish, everyone in the city should have a lot of pride in their work and the work of their teams at the Seattle Fire Department and Seattle Police Department. And with that, Chief Best, I'll give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, very, very much for your words. Um, you've covered a lot of the events and what happened over the course of the weekend. I don't need to add a lot to that. I will say that um, earlier today uh, I was at a press briefing with um, Chief Scoggins and we talked about, you know, the horrific uh, murder of George Floyd and how it affected us as a nation, as a state, as a country, and as a city, but more importantly, how it affected us as members of the community, people who love Seattle. You know, I grew up in this area. Chief Scoggins is a transplant, but we're both folks who personally have family members who are African American, like ourselves, who um, we feel we feel the pain and the rage that can come when people feel like there is just you know, indiscriminate um, racism that affects the lives, daily lives of people um, and the people that we know and love. So we came to it with a very personal perspective. I can tell you that, like the mayor said, we believe that people can come to the city, they can demonstrate, they can protest, they can express their freedom of speech, and they can do so in a way that's peaceful and that gets their message across. And so many thousands of people came to the city of Seattle and tried to do the, just that. And we had officers lining the streets, willing and able and wanting to help them to do just that. Unfortunately, we had a whole nother segment of folks who showed up with nothing but criminal intent on their mind. They are not here to support the efforts and the will of the people who want to express themselves. They were only here to do bad deeds. They broke down windows, they broke into stores, they stole and looted property, they assaulted officers, they threw rocks, they threw bottles, they, you know, graffiti buildings. This is not what people who are trying to express their opinion do. This is what criminals do. So we have to differentiate between the two. I wholeheartedly respect um, the folks who want to come out and, and exercise their First Amendment free speech rights. I really believe that this is a time of reconciliation and a time of acknowledging you know, the past and looking toward the future. As the mayor mentioned, when we talk about reform, we are looking ahead to a future of innovation and a future of making good decisions and examining what we can do better in the future. The events of the past week they shattered really an already divided nation. But one thing that we can all agree on is that George Floyd should not have died. His death was unacceptable, and it will be handled at one point by the criminal justice system in Minnesota. However, we here in Seattle, we need to move forward with healing here and now. I have officers who are working day in and day out to protect the rights and the freedoms of people who want to express themselves. And we have people who want to come out and do it. We should be able to do that. 
But what we can't have is people coming into this city and literally tearing it up. And it is a horrible thing to see. My heart breaks when I saw all of the damage that happened. And for those who uh, thought the officers weren't engaging, they were. We made multiple arrests, dozens of arrests of people for looting and for stealing property. But there were so many people out there with ill intent on their mind and also trying to attack the officers. The timeline will be revealed. You'll see what happened to the men and women of the department. It was just not right. You know, and we have to do what's right here. So I implore people to, um, to have calm, to express themselves as they should in a free and democratic society without violence, without property damage. But if people come into the city to destroy the city, we have to take action. And that's one of the reasons that one of the tools that we have is the curfew. I asked the mayor to allow us to have that curfew so we could simply have the space to make sure that we could clear up any issues, that we could uh, respond to any things that were happening in the city. They tore the city up. There was no way that we were going to be able to have people commingle and nonchalantly come into downtown while rocks and bottles were being thrown, while stores were wide open, they hadn't been covered yet. We needed to have time to have reconciliation, to clear out the city, to make it safe for everybody. And I, we need more time to do that. We still have a number of demonstrations that are occurring. We know that uh, people who have ill intent are hijacking those demonstrations. They're doing property damage. They're assaulting our officers. So we need to have the space to have the tool of a curfew. And as was mentioned earlier, cities all across the nation are doing the same thing. This is an emergency order. This is not something we want to do all the time and oppress people and not have them be able to um, exercise their free speech and be here. But we are in a state of emergency. Millions of dollars of property damage, officers being assaulted. And so for those reasons, I've asked the mayor to continue the curfew. It will take it on a day-by-day -day basis, but it is really important for public safety. Thanks. Chief Scoggins. Good afternoon. My name is Harold Scoggins, Fire Chief of the Seattle Fire Department. Um, I want to start off with, with a few thank yous. Thank you to the mayor for your steady leadership. It's important for us as a city and a community to have steady le leadership. Thank you to Chief Best for your public safety partnership. And thank you to all of our, our executive peers here in the city of Seattle who have been working hard to serve community. And I also want to thank the men and women of the Seattle Fire Department, our sworn and professional staff who have been working around the clock um, over the last several days to continue to serve community. I just want to give you a brief update on some of the challenges that we have faced over the last few days. On Saturday, May 30th, we responded to approximately 32 calls um, in and around the different protests. Twelve of those 32 calls were related to fire-related type responses. Many of you saw the eight vehicle fires that we responded to. And then on Sunday, May 31st, we responded to 22 calls. And five of those 22 calls were fire-related responses. And luckily, none of them became very large, and they were all small in the incipient phase. But one of the asks I have for those who are out there protesting and, and expressing your First Amendment rights is when you see our firefighters, our ambulances, our, our medic units, our engines, our ladder trucks, if you can move to the right so we can get, get through. It's important that we get to where we need to be because if we're coming in, there's a fire or there's a medical emergency, and both of those are built on time. So I'm just asking for you to work with us as we were working with you through this pandemic and through these protests. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, I want to also, uh, on, meanwhile, we are still in a pandemic. Um, and on that front, we, this morning, you'll see that, the numbers, that the, the numbers of infections continue to rise in Seattle and King County. Uh, today, King County will be applying for businesses in King County to be able to move some of those businesses to phase two. Um, and we then will get a ruling from the governor on whether that's allowed, and if so, that we will need to start implementing in the city of Seattle how those businesses are going to operate, um, looking to the Seattle P King County Public Health in terms of the, the public health guidelines that will, will go with that business operations, for example, employees needing to wear masks, uh, what they do to take their temperature, uh, a whole range of sanitation. So, uh, this will be a very busy week just on trying to start to reopen our economy and our businesses. And I'll say it was 
one of the things that was very um, sad for me on Saturday and Sunday was to talk to small business owners who had been hanging on by a thread for these last two months with their businesses closed, not sure how they would emerge, but getting ready to emerge, having some hope on the horizon that they could start to make money again and open their businesses, only to have their businesses damaged or vandalized by looters uh, on Saturday or Sunday. So we in the city are working very hard to address those. Um, we had numerous requests from the Chinatown International District, which has been one of the hardest hit part of our city since the beginning of this pandemic, uh, to help their businesses who were hit with broken windows and graffiti and those who feared it. So uh, till 2 o'clock in the morning, or one, somewhere around 1 or 2 a.m., our crews from Seattle Public Utilities and Seattle Department of Transportation were working with the community to help board up the windows uh, in Chinatown International District. It's a sad commentary that we had to, but it gave a, a tremendous amount of relief to the, that community which has been hit so hard. Uh, happy to take some questions on either where we are on pandemic planning uh, and what we're seeing there or on the events of this weekend or where we are going forward and the questions can be addressed to either me or either of the chiefs. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief Carmen Best and Chief Harold Scoggins. Um, quick reminder today that I will be muting and unmuting you as we move forward asking questions. And please, uh, many people have been waiting patiently today to ask questions, so if you could please keep it to one question per outlet, that would be greatly appreciated. Our and I, I'm only going to answer the first question. So whatever you want your question to be, you better ask it first. Thank you, Mayor. Our first question will be from Michelle Esteban from uh, Como News, followed by Michael Crow, King 5. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mayor. I appreciate your time. My question is for Chief Best, if I can direct it to her. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> Hi there, Chief Best. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you and your time. Um, I wanted to ask you about the metrics of the arrest and what percentage of those arrested might be from out of the city. I think I just heard you say that we can't have people coming into the city to cause destruction. So I'm looking for the metrics on who are these people that were arrested. Perhaps some of the intelligence that you collected sure. will also, in terms of who they are, where yeah, they're from. absolutely. Sure. Let me, let me clarify. When I said coming into the city, I, I really meant just people coming into downtown. From some of them f f were from the city, but we are looking at. Um, all of the residences and locations. We're trying to verify the names uh, to make sure that we can match the names with where people actually reside. Um, it may come as a surprise to you, but some people actually don't tell us the truth about who they are and where they live. So we have to do a little bit of verification before we put that information out. I anticipate having it ready to go sometime this afternoon, uh, and we're working on it uh, right now. So I can't give you uh, anything more than that uh, because I just want to make sure that we get it right. You know, accuracy is so important. Next okay. question will be from Michael Crow, King 5, followed by Richard Reed, LA Times. Michael, the floor is yours. There, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for taking my question here. Uh, just a question uh, for the mayor. Uh, with King County trying to get, of course, to, to the modified phase one of reopening, is there any concern right now that, that these, these large gatherings of hundreds and thousands of people over the weekend might have some impact on uh, the coronavirus cases that could impact the timeline. Uh, yes, there is a concern of that. I've not yet had a chance to talk to King County Public Health officers about that. Um, but throughout this, the reason we had a limitation on gatherings is because of the way this virus is communicated. People did what they had to over the last almost three months now, and it's been with devastating economic impacts and social impacts. But as a result of that, about 95% of the people of King County and probably Seattle have not been exposed to the virus. When people come together, that gives the virus the opportunity to spread. And not only are those people might get sick, but they can bring it home to their families and their other loved ones. And so I would urge people, again, if you're going to gather, please try to keep your social distance. Please try to wear face coverings um, and try to limit your physical contact with people. Um, it's, it's anathema to how you protest and organize, uh, but the pandemic is real. And following these events, for people who have been in those large crowds, please, if you start to experience any of the symptoms that are related to COVID, 
please get to a healthcare practitioner so you can report it and if necessary get tested. Uh, it is going to be the only way we move forward as a city and a county and a state is if we can control the number of infections and don't overrun our healthcare system. And so people can communicate the disease even before they know they're sick. And it's so important for people to get immediate attention and testing so that people around them that they've had contact with can also be reviewed for their symptoms and tested if necessary and that people can be isolated so they don't give COVID to other people. Um, so yes, we have that concern. You, you see these events where people coming close together like that and we have seen over the last three months that events like that, and I'm not saying protests, but events where people come together in those types of crowds become what they're known now as super spreading events. And we've seen it from beaches to spring breaks to other types of events. So we're very hopeful that doesn't happen, but we truly do want to urge anyone who was in the crowd, just having a face covering does not protect you. If you start to develop symptoms, please have them checked. Our next question will be from Richard Reed, LA Times, followed by Simone Del Rosario, Q13 News. Richard, the floor is yours. It's a question for Chief Best. Um, the mayor described these men arriving with backpacks full of weapons and so on. Um, I realize it's difficult uh, for you to say, as, as you said, the facts are still coming out and it, it is an ongoing investigation. But what more is known about these people currently uh, and others who are um, responsible for violence. Are you seeing Antifa or far-right organizations? Is there any indication that groups might be coordinating with other cities? Well, it's a little early to say that definitively, uh, but you know, based on my experience and what I know of how um, some of these groups act, it certainly would be um, likely to be the fact. So you're right, I don't want to uh, preempt an investigation and all the information that will be coming out uh, later, but certainly the acts and the, the things that we saw occurring are consistent with the method of operation of um, those group members. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Our next question will be from Simone Del Rosario, Q13 News, followed by Carolyn Vick, South Seattle Emerald. Simone, the floor is yours. Thank you for taking my question. This would be for Chief Best. With one question, I'll keep it really straightforward. As you evaluate Saturday's events, the timeline from what your officers were facing, in addition to the actions your officers took, what letter grade would you give your department at this time for Saturday's actions? Well, you know what, I, just, I can tell you this, because uh, letter grades don't matter. Uh, what really matters is what did the men and women out there do and I think they did a tremendous job under extremely different, uh, difficult circumstances. You know, as a mayor uh, listed in the timeline, it was really quite difficult. If you can imagine, and many of your reporters were out there, I'm sure they can tell you, rocks and bottles, lasers in their eyes, you know, urine, feces, you know, accelerants on buildings. It was really difficult. Thousands of people out there, um, you know, with nothing but ill intent, and it was directed specifically uh, at the police officers. So uh, that was really trying. So I think that anyone facing that and getting through that day, and this city did a great job. We had a number of departments working together under the leadership of our mayor, with our par in partnership with our fire department and other city departments. You know, it, it wasn't a perfect day, but we did a lot better than a lot of other places. Look around the nation. You know, we didn't have buildings burnt to the ground. You know, we didn't have people shot. Nobody died. You know, and so even that it was a success in a lot of ways. So rather than give a letter grade, I would just say I'm completely honored and humbled to be a part of an organization where the men and women stepped up and did their job under tremendously difficult circumstances. Thank you, Chief. Our next question will be from Carolyn Vick, South Seattle Emerald, followed by Deborah Horn, Cairo 7. Carolyn, the floor is yours. Hi, this question is for Mayor Durkin. Um, so, Mayor, I'm, I'm aware you already addressed the issue, to, issue of covered badge numbers yesterday, but this is still re relevant given some pictures from yesterday the Emerald received this morning. I want to ask, if officers are still allowed to cover their badge numbers, will they be required to wear the special morning badges that are engraved with their badge numbers as authorized by the Seattle Police Foundation? And if not, will they be required to take off their helmets and sunglasses so that people can identify who they are since there are videos of them not responding to protesters 
when asked for their names. Um, and if neither of those apply, um, how will be people be able to lodge complaints against officers they feel that have acted inappropriately with the OPA? Caroline, thank you for that question, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify once again. Um, the Seattle Police Department regulations require every police officer to display a badge that has their name on it. And every one of the photos that I've seen where people are complaining about an officer wearing a morning badge, on the other side of their chest is their name. Um, we know who our officers are. We know where they are deployed. I don't believe there's ever been a circumstance where someone has made a complaint against an officer where we've not been able to identify who the officer was. With regards to the morning badges, again, this is a, a long tradition where officers wear a badge with a black stripe that they put on there because it's a tradition for when an officer is killed in the line of duty from either their department or an adjoining police department. And they wear that until they're able to have the service for that person. In this circumstance, there's two officers from other law enforcement entities who were killed in the line of duty, who Chief Best talked about yesterday, and they've not yet had the ability to bury them because of COVID. There was no attempt by anyone to cover badge numbers. We will look at the policy to see if even on morning badges there can be a way for a badge number to be displayed. But again, I think the really important thing for you to communicate to readers is the badge number is a fallback and in some ways a unnecessary redundancy. It is their name that is important, who they are and how they police. But we'll of course look at that to see if there's ways that we can you know, give the public more confidence and give police officers the opportunity to show their mourning for other officers. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question will be from Deborah Horn, Cairo 7, followed by Daniel Beekman, Seattle Times. Deborah, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Mayor and Police Chief Best. I want to ask another question about the curfew. And you have the curfew. It's going to last until 6 o'clock. It's hard to ask just one question, but I will do my best. It's going to last until 6 o'clock. Yesterday, people were still in the park until 11 o'clock at night. Lasting until 6, or is that just a, a general time of when you want most people to leave and you'll take care of the others? And will people see anything different in terms of policing and making sure that property is not vandalized like it was over the weekend? So I will let the chief talk to most of that, but I think one thing, Deborah, that's really important that you pointed out is um, the curfew is a tool that the police can use like any other law to help control and maintain public safety. But like with everything, they must use their discretion and, and in this case balance it against the, the lawful right of people to gather and express their First Amendment rights. I think you saw yesterday the police department is using their discretion to allow those peaceful gatherings even though there was a curfew in place. Um, but had there been unlawful, if there had been illegal activity, it would have given them another tool. I also just want to clarify, I'll let the chief talk, but it starts at 6 p.m. and goes until tomorrow. It isn't until 6 p.m. So it starts at 6 p.m. tonight. Chief, do you want to address the curfew too? Sure. sure. Hi, Deborah. As you know, um, you know, we're really concerned with public safety. We have to make decisions in the field. The curfew, the same curfew that many other cities across the country and even locally are, are looking at uh, Im implementing, it's simply because we can make sure that we, that we can, you know, the law-abiding folks can, uh, are not there and the folks who are there to do, um, you know, ill will, that, that we can better identify who they are and better operate. Last night, uh, as you know, a lot of people showed up at downtown. Uh, they moved around the city. They moved up into Capitol Hill, and they came back, and they ended up at Westlake uh, Mall. There was about uh, upwards of 800 folks there. Uh, we wanted to uh, use good judgment. I trust my commanders. Uh, we talked to some of the organizers and folks um, to try to get them to move along after they had some of their speeches. It was in the best interest of public safety not to have physical confrontations with all the folks. We gave them as much opportunity as we could, and then we had to move them out. Um, and and uh, by and large, most folks left uh, relatively peacefully. And at the end of the day, if uh, while we're going to make sure that we uh, follow and try to operationalize that curfew, uh, ultimately what we want is we don't want our downtown uh, to be destroyed by people who come in to do ill work. 
and uh, we'll always work on the side of judgment of making sure that we're doing the right thing. In terms of the vandalism and the looting that was occurring, as I said earlier, we made dozens of arrests of looters, uh, dozens. Uh, we had our officers all over the city making sure that we could try to minimize the um, damage. And while there was a lot of damage and it was heartbreaking to see, absolutely heartbreaking, it would have been way worse without the cops being out there. So those who want to criticize, I say, you know, we had as many people out there working as hard as we could to protect life first and property as a secondary uh, uh, target there. Uh, and we did a lot of work in that area. So, and if we hadn't been there, uh, what we saw would have been way worse than what we did have at the end of the day. So I feel like uh, the officers are doing the best they can to make sure that we identify and arrest um, people who are looting. But um, that's part of the reason that we implemented the curfew so we could better um, have control of the situation when it occurs in the city. Our next question will be from Daniel Beekman, Seattle Times, followed by Kate Walters, KUOW. Dan, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. And this is a question for either the mayor or uh, Chief Best. Um, some city council members this morning, including the public safety chair, Lisa Herbold, um, brought up a, a question concerns about uh, police officers, I think on Saturday in particular, um, uh, firing tear gas and or flashbangs into crowds without prior um, warning or audible warning and suggesting that that was in violation of city law. Uh, can, just, can you speak to whether uh, you know whether that occurred or not and um, how it relates to the law? Thanks. So this is the first that uh, council member Herbold has raised that. I don't believe she, I know she hasn't called me. I don't believe she's called the chief. She hasn't. Um, obviously she has a concern about that. We will look at all facts and whether the deployment of uh, less than lethal force was in accordance with Seattle Police Department regulations. So we'll look at that. Um, I don't know uh, the facts of the case that she's indicating and what she might have personal information about or what she's heard from other people. Um, but we'll reach out to the council member to see what it is she's concerned about. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question will be from Kate Walters, KUOW, followed by Erica Barnett, C is for Crank. Kate, the floor is yours. Okay, Kate, we will circle back to you. Erica, you will be our next question asker, followed by Steve Militich, Seattle Times. Erica, the floor is yours. Hi, I have another question about the curfews. Um, you said this weekend, and it has been reiterated in this press conference that uh, a curfew takes lawful people off the street. Obviously, there were peaceful protesters who were out um, after the curfew this weekend or on Sunday in particular. Um, do you uh, do you stand by that statement that uh, it takes lawful people off the street so that uh, the unlawful people can be identified? And do you think the curfews are working as planned? It was one tool, and I think that we showed that it did work. Um, and I think we also showed that the police used their discretion appropriately to determine whether to balance the First Amendment rights to gather peacefully against a lawful order under a curfew. And they made the decision that those people who were gathering peacefully could continue to do so. So I think that the curfew is one tool. The chief believes it's a tool that she needs to maintain public safety. She is charged with maintaining public safety under our city charter, um, and I have every confidence that her uh, decisions and her judgment has been correct. Uh, and I think that the difference between what happened Saturday night and Sunday shows that we did use some effective uh, tactics to get a different result. Thank you, Mayor. And our final question today will come from Steve Militich, Seattle Times. Yeah, Seattle Times is doubling up on us. Hi, Steve. Steve, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Oh, you cut out. We are in interest of... Can you hear me now? There we go. This must be like a Zoom call. Can you hear me now? We got you. Okay. Madam Mayor, in the interest of community healing, 
would you consider bringing together the community leaders, Bob, and anyone else you feel would be helpful, and withdraw motion currently before the U.S. District Court and try to reach some kind of community consensus on police accountability? I, I, I would always be open to that. I mean, I think that uh, one positive thing that people may have not noticed in the chaos of the last four days was the public statement that the president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild gave about the death of Mr. Floyd, which acknowledged that the death was wrongful, that the police acted wrongful, and recognized that those acts and acts of police officers can always undermine the trust, and it's their obligation as police officers to regain that trust, not through words, but through actions. So I believe that reconciliation is a really important thing for healing. Um, as you know, the Community Police Commission was an attempt to try to have a formal body that had that kind of dialogue, so that specifically included members from the Police Officers Guild and the Police Management Union, as well as community. Um, we know we need more dialogue than that, so I think that that is a good idea. Um, obviously, the community members would like would have to know that they would feel that that it was important and effective for them as would the police officers guild but i always think that dialogue is better speaking is better people can disagree but you will never get a uh, healing as you say unless there is a concerted effort to acknowledge both conduct that has caused harm and the need and ability to move forward. So I think it's a good idea. Thank you, Mayor. That concludes today's Q&A portion of the press conference. Thank you, uh, everyone, for tuning in. We will uh, try to give these briefings regular until they're not needed. If there's updates that need to be given, we will. Please look at the Seattle Police Department's blog. It does give you a very specific timeline showing, for example, that in, in a just short period of time, we had vehicle fires, we had Molotov cocktails being thrown at officers, we had accelerant being poured at HQ that required a fire response. Um, we had thousands of people pouring onto the freeway. All of this while thousands of people were gathering peacefully to protest um, what is a huge injustice and a reflection of a greater injustice in our nation's history. We will continue to do everything we can to allow people to protest peacefully, regardless of the content of their protests. But what we cannot tolerate is people acting criminally, looting buildings, stealing property, causing damage, throwing starting fires, and assaulting police. Um, we believe we can come together and express our differences and express our First Amendment rights in a way that does uh, honors the death of Mr. Floyd. And I don't want to use my words, I want to use the words of his brother who said the incidents of violence did nothing to honor his brother. Thank you very much.